Welcome to Societal Shapers, a podcast by PL Cadilla, the place to get inspired, find your purpose and courage, and get tools to become the next female leader, creating real results and meaningful changes. Hi, welcome to the Societal Shapers podcast. Today, I'm your host, PL Cadilla, and I have Isa from Winner. I'll let Isa do all the introductions. So Isa, tell me a bit more about yourself, the work that you do in these um, in the uh, non- non-profit space as well as the commercial space. All right, thank you, PL, for having me today. So hi everyone, my name is Isa. I'm uh, president of the Women Entrepreneur Network Association. So we are a group of entrepreneurs um, that work together to advance, you know, um, better policies for women in general, specifically for the entrepreneurs. Okay, so as a, uh, professionally, I'm a mobile application developer, so we build apps for people. And our latest project is a fintech project where we are building a platform for microfunding. So in this microfunding platform, we look at receiving donations and that donation in turn is given out as a interest-free loan. And when the, the woman pays it back, it goes to fund another person. So this is like a donation that keeps on giving. Wow, that's amazing. So when did this start? I started um, in March last year. So we had um, this uh, accelerator that just opened. So it was the Financial Insurance Lab and it was done by the United Nations, UNCDF, together with uh, Bank Negara and the Securities Commission. So we applied and then we got in and that allowed us the opportunity to actually build this idea and we ended up as uh, top six of that accelerator. Wow, fantastic. (laughs) That's brilliant. Women power all the way, right? Thank you. Tell us a bit more about how does a does a platform work, right? So right now for me this is new information entirely. Sure, sure. And so if I wanted to donate um, mm-hmm. funds, like mm-hmm. where do I go to, and and do I know where my funds go, or do you decide on that, or do I do I have any you know information that you provide to tell me that you know this uh, donation has, has gone out to this entrepreneur particularly, for example? Yes. So what happens is that. Uh, we're still in the midst of building the platform. So one part of it is ready and then the rest is ongoing work. So what happens is that, say you give 100 ringgit. So when you give 100 ringgit, so that goes into this pool. So as soon as it reaches 1,000, this is the quantum that we give out. So when it reaches 1,000, we give it out to entrepreneur A, for example. So then Mm. you will have an app that says, okay, your money has now gone out to this entrepreneur A. And then as soon as she pays back, that money will then, you can see that, oh, the money has now gone to entrepreneur B. And then so on and so forth. So you always know where your money is at any one time. That's so that would be from the donor's perspective. That's yeah, great yeah. transparency there. Yeah. So people also know what this what this entrepreneur what this entrepreneur's micro business is all about. Yes. So we, we try to protect a little bit um you know in, in terms of PDPA. So we will not maybe not disclose her full name. So maybe just her name so that it protects her privacy. But it will it, you will know uh, what business she's in at least right. And then also um, another thing that we do um, is that we try the entrepreneur's performance so that when we give out this loan, it's over 10 months. So over 10 months, what we would like to do is to see whether this has helped you increase your business. So we don't just give money. So Mm. with the money, we also provide uh, mentors so that you can actually grow your business. So when we we give out this kind of cash, we're also looking for people who want to grow their business. Mm. So thankfully, um, uh, two months ago, we, we managed to get um, the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs come on board. So that way we can actually push out an educational program as well. So this is like um, the Academy teaches women how to structure their business. So mm. together with that, it strengthens our proposal. Wow, that's really good, Isa. I'm really happy to hear that. So based on your work um, and mm-hmm. the research and then the exposure and experience that you've had, right? tell us a bit more about how has the current pandemic exposed the challenges and limitations faced by the women of Malaysia and the aging population? Yeah, so, so recently, um, because of the pandemic, we, we see the importance of why you have to register your business. Right? So before this, um, people felt like, Registering your business is not a needed thing. So in order for you to get the prehatin grant for business owners and all that, you have to have a registered business. Mm-hmm. But we see this, um, uh, what do you call it? There's a, a conundrum in the psyche where people feel that as soon as I register my business, I do not get brim. So mm. the women are scared, right? So they, they don't want to register business because they feel that they need to have this financial assistance. Mm. Uh, because for some reason, as soon as you register your business, you're not entitled to that. So this is one of the things that we've been um, asking the government to reconsider. 
let's not penalize people for having a registered business because they are still in the B40 category and they should still receive whatever aid they have regardless yes. of whether they have their name in the business or not. Because sometimes it's just the husband's uh, business and you put your name there. Correct. Yes, yeah, so stuff like that. And then okay. we, we also see um, a great impact, I think, to the aging population, especially with this water issue that just recently happened. So you see that they are badly affected. They can't go out to carry things and stuff like that. So it, the same thing happened during the pandemic where they are not able to, or they're not, they should not leave their house. You know, because it's not safe for them to be out and about. Mm -hmm. So then we need to find a way where we can um, create a society that is less dependent on people actually moving around, but more open to what we see nowadays, where you can order your food, let them come in, you know, and, and things like that. So this is one of the things that we've also been doing. So we have a product called um, Kita Jaga Kita. So this is the marketing platform for Mad Cash, where we want to allow people to, to see, as soon as they have the app, what are the businesses within 10 kilometers of their area. And then if they want to support those business, they could do so. And at the same time, they could also like say, I'm going to buy um, nasi lemak for myself. I can buy it for someone else and put it on a suspended meal board. So anybody who needs food can just pick it up because I've already paid for it. So these are the things that we're, we're looking at giving because we know that though the, the crisis may look like it's over, but I think um, you can see in the coming months, it'll be worse, I think, as people start to lose their jobs and, and start to have to deal with the realities of what has happened. Yeah, yeah. true. So what's interesting is what I find is the, the low-hanging fruit when someone loses their jobs mm -hmm. um, is that they, you know, the, the, the default business that people can go into is food right, F and B, because that's, that's the easiest, the fastest, and people need to eat. So, you know, given the, the pandemic and, and looking at a, a more longer term vision, what are in plans or just, you know, the thought about what kind of work will be the future for the most vulnerable um, uh, communities? I think that in, in Malaysia especially, Food is still the prevalent industry, right? Just, yeah. just because like, um, I have friends who live in, in uh, European countries when they lose their job, it's, it's almost the end of their life, right? So but mm -hmm. in Malaysia, you can always pick up and do something. But what we're looking at uh, building is an entire ecosystem. So let's say if I can't cook to save my life, yeah. can I That's be a, yeah. <laughs> so can I be like a, a producer of something? Can I do vertical farming? Can mm. I just supply like uh, if I can grow chili really well, can I just supply the chilies? Can I just supply a specific part of that? So you, you can see like uh, in a real ecosystem, even things like I can cut the vegetables for you and then I pass it to you and you can cook it. So these are things that could be done if we build a real ecosystem where um, we can get producers, uh, workers, as well as the final end product to be in one whole ecosystem. You know, so you don't have to do everything. You can be part of it and still contribute and earn an income. Okay, so who, who currently is looking at this ecosystem? So this is also part of the work that, that we are doing in the Cash. So we, we started like um, in August when we, we launched the search for our first cohort for the academy. We had about 700 applications. From 700 applications, we are only looking for 30. But when we asked them why they wanted to be in or what's happening in their lives, we see that almost all of them had the same story. So either... Um, their husbands lost their job, they lost their jobs, and that's why they're looking for something to help them move their business. So some are just starting out, some have started and now need to go full-time. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so we see those kind of things happening, but it's not all food. Um, there are many, many things that people do. So it's mm -hmm. just that um, what, what we see is that people need a structure. So you need to, just, just because you can cook doesn't mean that you know how to run a business. Because you know, yeah. at the end of the day, you need to be able to run it so that it makes a profit and it makes a sustainable income to you. So especially food handling, it's very important to know how to handle it correctly because you yeah. don't want cases where people die because they consume your food. Yeah. yeah. So at the moment, uh, which ministries are helping and what policies should be in place to ensure, you know, the things that you've mentioned to ensure that those things are being moved, someone is looking after it, are helping and supporting it? Um, there's no news yet. I mean, I think, I think after the, there was a case where um, a few people got food, a few hundred of people got food poisoning and I think one person died, that um, there was a lot of hoo-ha about all this, but there's no, no one actually stepping up to say that they would actually do it. 
So then, um, Sorry, you, yeah, share this story again. What happened? Um, I think there was one one person who was supplying um something like a yogurt. I think so. It was during the um, uh, I think during Raya or something like that. So it mm-hmm. cost about two hundred people to get food poisoning, and unfortunately, one of them died. Oh yeah, my because God. Of that, yeah. Was, did so, this appear in the news? Yeah, it was quite big. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah okay. So so that that um increased the awareness on what is it that mm. needs to be done. So like if you had a, a license from the government, you would be required to get your typhoid shot and you have to go for food handling. So when you are a home based business, usually yes. you just go ahead and do it. So mm. these are the things that, that when we talk to women, we talk about the importance of actually uh, doing it properly. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and making sure that what you're doing will actually uh, build your business and not kill it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I know this is from more from an economic um, mm-hmm. uh, perspective, right? The questions mm-hmm. that I'm asking on how to help women. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, with the pandemic, um, you know, so we see that the, that the cases of abuses uh you know came was on the rise Mm -hmm. and then you know more more complaints were coming through but then you know what are the kinds of uh policies that actually keep and help protect these women uh from these kinds of abuses so right now um i think it was during the a few years ago we we managed to implement this policy because it was discussed quite a bit among the women where Mm. let's say um you have a domestic abuse case, uh, usually what happens is that you go to the police station, we report it, and then the police sends you home to your husband. So now mm. um, now the welfare department has the right to actually separate the husband from the wife, get an a interim order to separate the, the man from coming home to his wife. So he's not allowed in until they go to court. So that if it happens over the weekend, usually the courts are not open. So the yeah. welfare officer can actually issue that interim order so that the woman can go home but without her husband being there. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's new development. This is yeah. new. Yes. So okay. it took a while. You know, like every, everything that, that um, happens in Malaysia, I think there's a lot of positive things that have changed, but it's just that it takes time to make these changes. So, um, yeah. And it's usually the women, NGOs, and especially um, women who are working on it, like WAO, um, I think a few of the organizations, they're the ones that focus on this. Mm. So in, in, in your opinion, right, uh-huh. so we've spoken about uh, some of the work that you do, the, the exposure uh, that you have, and also the work that you have with the, the, the different ministries. In your opinion, how do we create a society that will start thinking about the collective well-being of the people and planet versus individualism and unfettered freedom? I would say that it comes from, from women itself. If we're talking about protecting women, we have to be the one that stands up and say it. So like, say, for example, if you watch uh, our TV, and you watch the dramas on TV, especially the Malay dramas, and, and you see that um, this is the way that they portray a family mm-hmm. behaves, how a man behaves towards his husband. So these are things that are not allowed. I mean, we should not encourage this. We should not be watching this. And we should ask them to stop making um, shows where it's okay for a man to hate his wife. It's okay mm-hmm. for a guy to rape a, a girl and then marry her because eventually uh, yeah. they'll fall in love and live happily ever after. So this is not acceptable in our society, but this is what's being shown on TV. So this is yeah. one of the things that we've been talking about for years that we need to have our media choose and select and and you know it's not called censorship but it's, it's more um what is it that we're portraying right so we need to have a greater awareness of what we are watching what we are allowing our kids to watch and how mm. that translates into an a norm behavior in society yeah and this is definitely part of policy making right i mean we i'm i'm sure many many ngos have actually brought this um to the forefront uh, because I've seen some of these dramas but this was like back you know when I was mm-hmm. a lot younger and then obviously mm-hmm. these these kinds of dramas are not the dramas I consume today but I can imagine mm-hmm. many many Malaysians particularly from the rural areas mm-hmm. would be consuming these sorts of, of films and dramas etc and therefore they create this mindset of you know of trying to you know a lot of things are patriarchal in in in, in terms of behaviors and mindsets mm-hmm. and also in terms of uh, you know, talking about sex, for example, that's completely mm. taboo, being able to yes. understand it. But the social impact of not being able to understand the full consequences of it is actually costing our economy, 
uh, impacting our, our, our women. And therefore, you know, I'm trying to relate it back to, to the number of women that we have in the workforce. I understand that, you know, there's about only 45% women in the workforce and we're trying mm. to increase this number. But, uh, you know, when we talk about wanting to have more women in the workforce, do we mean about them just coming up and starting a, their own business and getting into the food business? Or are we really looking at a, at a, at a longer term vision of how women can play a better, uh, more productive and value adding role in our society? So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so one of the things that WENA does um, on a yearly basis, so we're already in our ninth year, we have this um, initiative called the Global Mentoring Walk. So mm. in this initiative, what we do is we pair a younger woman with an older woman who has experience in a particular career that she wants to pursue, the younger girl. Right? So what, what happens is that when, when a young person sees a role model in what she wants to pursue, then she finds that this is a career path that I could go to. But mm. if you don't see this happening, you don't, like, if you look at, um, you look at any launch event and you see all the corporate heads on stage, they're all men. Right? There's hardly any woman that is a corporate GLC head, for example. Right? So then when that happens, um, there's no role model for, for young girls to look at. So they don't see it as a viable business. And I think mm -hmm. when you talk about women in the workforce, um, there are a lot of women who are working, but they don't have registered business. So we are not seen as contributing to the economy when we are, actually. Mm -hmm. right? But we are not seen because we don't register the business. So yeah. this is one of the things that we keep telling people that register your business so that your contribution is seen. And it's not mm -hmm. just from an individual perspective, it's also from a country perspective and in order for women to be seen as contributing to the economy. Yeah. So how do you measure the success of the global mentoring walk? Um, usually what happens is that uh, when we hear stories about how, oh, I walk with this person and then all of a sudden this person has joined me in my business and I'm mentoring her to, to build one of her own. So those are success stories that we see. And sometimes um, when we get a prominent uh, mentor coming in, uh, it also allows people to have access to her when they would normally not. So this, these mm. are the things that we really appreciate it when people give their time to spend that one hour walking with someone. Because oh, you never know what impact that could have you know, yeah. on someone's life. Absolutely. When's the next session? Oh, it was supposed to be, we do it every year in March. So unfortunately, because of the pandemic, yeah. <laughs> it stopped yeah. just before my walk. <laughs> you know, so uh, next year, hopefully in March, we can walk again. Okay, yeah. so there won't be any any walk this year. No, usually it's done on because we do it with other countries. So there's about um, I think a hundred countries around the world. So it usually happens on Women's Day, which is on March eighth. Oh, okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah, so we want to walk together, right? So all women yeah. from all walks of life. But we've done it once in a shopping mall because I thought, why not? <laughs> So we walk in a shopping mall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Why not? <laughs> At the end of the day, is the time that you spend with that mentor. Yes. So it doesn't really matter where you walk. The point is that as long as you get to spend that time with that person, then therefore the bond and then the connection is, is created. Yeah, so maybe you yeah. could consider just doing something this year. Even a virtual walk will be, oh, yeah, I think, definitely. even, even yeah, That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> yeah, and I would love to, to be part of it. Oh, for cool, this year. excellent. <laughs> yeah, so... In, in terms of like uh, mindsets and behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. What are the most immediate behaviors and mindsets that we need to change today to create secure and safer societies in the future? Um, I would say the, the one thing that, that we have seen from the pandemic is how people have stepped up to help others. You know, mm. so it used to be that um, my family is mine and mine alone. So now we want to, to look at our neighbors and, and see what's happening in their lives and maybe do that helping hand. So if your neighbor can't, um, go out to buy food, can, can they ask you to buy food on their behalf and things like that. So I think that, that's the positive change that I've seen in society and how people have really gone all out to help each other. Yeah. And, and that would be the same concept of why we are asking um, people, uh, women who are more successful to come back and mentor. Because we want to build that ecosystem where um, we support each other. So not to be too feminist, but it's more like you know, when, when we get a donation, we, we fund your business, then you give it back, you fund another woman, and then we have mentors that come back to help you. So that, on its own, creates that ecosystem of women, um, growing women. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a different and uh, thought process altogether because a, a woman and a man, I mean, there's, there's value, of course, to having men as mentors, but there's a difference between a man mentor and a woman mentor because the woman has all kinds of roles in her life, and she does all of it at the same time. 
right? We never leave our work home, nor do we leave our home at work. <laughs> so. Yes, yes, absolutely. So in terms of like the help, so, so the, one, the, the one part that you mentioned, which, you know, a lot of people on an individual level has mm-hmm. stepped up, particularly in the pandemic. And I think this is, you know, such an amazing thing about mm-hmm. Malaysians in general. Mm-hmm. We're really kind-hearted, good-hearted people. And that's great, right? But in terms of, you know, wanting to create and generate more work for mm-hmm. women, aging population Mm -hmm. in the workforce we really need more uh, support not just from on an individual level i.e civil society Mm -hmm. level but we need support from the private sector as well as the government sector through policies and interventions and regulations etc so how much of the support that's coming from these two sectors Mm -hmm. is promoting and and pushing for women in the workforce i really like um, the penjana scheme of if you hire somebody above 40 um, the government will, for the next three months, uh, we uh, support 1,000 ringgit to that company for hiring that person. So I thought initiatives like this, it looks small, but it actually helps, right? So there's uh, this kind of um, things I, I really appreciate from the government. And I yeah. think it's it's also for... Uh, so it's working. Have, it's working. working. Yeah, it's yeah. working for someone, yeah. So also we see um, that as soon as someone retires or loses their jobs, they get into this depression mode. Mm. Yeah, they, they feel depressed, they feel that they are no longer needed in the workforce. So these are ways where if let's say you used to be a professional, you will have retired, you can come back always to mentor. You know, that's one way that you give back to the community. So that we yeah. one way. And the other way would be to be active in NGOs because NGOs are out there everywhere and we always need people who are willing to give their time. Yeah. And at the same time, you could also look into um, something that, that you can use based on your previous experience that can generate some kind of income for you. So these are the things that as an NGO, we help people find yeah. you know, if, if they need help. Yeah. So one point that you raised there, which I find really interesting, mm-hmm. is the um, depression, right? Yeah. So in, in many of my uh, podcast interviews with mm-hmm. people championing any cause, there's always, you know, with every, um, with ev- with every, I would say, I don't know whether I should call it beneficiary, you know, but, for, but with every cluster of um, the community who are impacted, either may, be, either may they be youth or women or girls, etc., uh, there will always be this mental impact on them, right? So we, we know that mental health is on the rise. Mm-hmm. However, it is, such a, it's, it is still a very taboo topic mm-hmm. as well today in our country and there is no support system from um, uh, from the government perspective in terms of being able to help or putting people through a system once they've gone through any any form of trauma right Mm -hmm. so linking it back to you know the women in workforce as well as the aging population this is something which is more womenly or feminine in nature in terms of Mm -hmm. wanting to support people and this could be an area where we could really really nurture Mm -hmm. more jobs of people in 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 these kinds of professional certified jobs that can help others so like yesterday i had a podcast interview with a with a lady who's who whose work is about promoting sexuality education Mm -hmm. and so her uh, beneficiaries um are mainly the the children who are in the system where they're sexually um active for whatever reason, with with permission, with consent, or without, um, and they and she and she said that basically in schools that every school should have a counselor, okay, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. but these counselors are basically not certified, don't, don't need to be certified, or a teacher would just uh, or the principal will just elect you and say okay you're going to be the counselor now, and they don't have any experience, they're not certified, they don't know how to do it, but are tasked to do it. So in the end, what happens is information gets leaked out, there's mm-hmm. shaming, uh, and then you know people start to to ostracize the student from society. The, the student just gets kicked out of school. And so there's no proper system to support. And all these children go through go through trauma, right? But they mm-hmm. don't have a system that, that will put pull them through. Similarly with the aging population, as as they finish as they reach their, their pension age and then they, they now suddenly feel like, oh, oh, I'm not that useful to society anymore and therefore they go through their trauma and their depression, etc. So that's an area which we haven't really looked into, an yes. area where we can create a lot more jobs and an area which you know, can really strengthen um, our, our pool of talent as well. Because you know, at the end of the day, when we start 
giving all the rep repetitive jobs to the robots and to, to the AIs and technology. So you need more people to be able to take over the jobs which require human interaction. Exactly. Yeah, and this and I, yeah, and I think this, this happens to not just women. I think the depression happens to men and women. Correct. Yeah, so exactly. this is yeah. the, the, the population. And, and because we're generally a young population, so we are only entering that aging community, but I think we will have about 15% aging community um, in the next few years. So exactly. This is, yeah, so this is becoming big enough to focus on. It is, absolutely. It is a, a, an issue with, with amongst the ASEAN country. We would be an aged population mm -hmm. uh, in 10 years' time, in a decade from now. Thailand would be a super aging population in the next 10 years because they've already, they already reached the aging, aging population where by most, uh, I think a certain percentage of the population are above the age of 65. And so that's how they consider the aging population. And so what would happen? Because then we would have you know, an economy where the number of younger people are lesser uh, in terms of um, the contributions that we need to support the aging population. So something needs to look through the system and how to ensure that we maximize the livelihood mm -hmm. of the aging population to be able to serve back the economy. So, mm -hmm. Aiza, um, mm -hmm. in, in, in terms of like, so this, the purpose of this podcast, right, is to really educate our audience, uh, create awareness, amplify your message. And so we want to know what can the audience do? What can the others do, particularly those within the T20 band, you know, the corporate professionals, uh, people working in government, and, and, and the privileged, you know, how can we contribute to real systemic changes and help you in your cause? I would say the, the biggest help we always need is to, is to get the mentors to come on board. So let's say you have a person who's starting out her business and what she could do is um, she could really um, use the help of people who have seen it before, right? So just mm. outside in look into your business. Sometimes you're doing something, you've been doing it for a few years and it's still at the same place. You know, we, we, we talk to people who... Um, started 10 years ago doing some business and they're still making only 200 a month. So I'm asking, is that enough? It's not. But they can't move out of it because they, they can't see um, what can you do? What, what next? So these are places and roles where mentors can come on board. So that would be one way where it's not a monetary uh, contribution, but it's more a time contribution. And at the same time, um, if, you, if you would like to contribute, there are many, many agencies out there who could use that assistance because you could see a lot of the foundations they go out and they actually help but for mad cash our goal would be instead of giving money we would like to um, give economic empowerment right so instead of just giving you cash to eat today um, and if your business is like um, what they call in Malay makan pagi kais pagi right can mm. we make it makan pagi kais petang so can it last one day can it yeah. last uh, two years so if you used to make food that only lasts a day can we use technology, we thought or something, so that it lasts two years. So these are the things that we're looking at specifically. Okay. That's the favorite so, business. So if you're looking at mentors, how many do you need? Oh, as many as we can. Like, like say, for example, when we, when we launched our academy, we had 700 people. So mm. I think I need 700 mentors. You yeah. know, if I can bring them all on board, that would be how many I need. Okay. 500 now. <laughs> out, of, out of 700. So how many do you have now? 100. Oh, 100. Yeah. That's, that's really good as well. Yeah. So out of like the 700, 30 people get to go through this program. Mm -hmm. But then the other 700, then you will probably push them back to another cohort. Um, or they to apply again? Okay, so when they get into the program, what happens is that um, the program, because it's sponsored by the US Embassy, allows all this uh, hands-on workshop and the specific mentoring. So what we're also thinking is that uh, because the, the US Embassy allows people to enter the academy because it's an online academy, but mm. you will not be supported the way that the city are supported, but you could still go in. And then maybe every two weeks or so, we'll have a session online where we discuss what you've learned. So we do want to invite the rest to come in and learn on their own. So at least you can benefit from the course itself. Because mm. you know, it really helps um, to define an idea. If you don't have an idea what you want to do, then if you go through yeah. the course, at least you'll find that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So to people listening, if you are a professional and you have some time to spare, please offer yourself. And how can we reach you, Aiza? Okay, so um, we, if you look for WENA, W-E-N-A, WENA mm -hmm. Malaysia, then the, there is a program called AWE, awesome, AWE. So it's the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs. So we would like you to come in through there and there'll be registrations for mentors and also for people who are interested to take the course online. 
Okay, fantastic. And if they wanted to donate, do, do they go to Metcash? Yes. So that's the app. Cash. Yes. And there's sign a, up. Uh, yes. There's so there's a, a website. It's called Get Metcash. Get Metcash. And yeah, then we, I just, we always uh, get hacked because people think that we're a scam. <laughs> it's Get Metcash. So M A D C A H. So ah, Metcash okay. uh, actually means uh, multiply uh, multiple uh, assist and donate. So Metcash. Mm, okay. Uh, okay. So we just go onto the app and then register yes, and then yes. donate them out, yes. right? Yeah, that's a website actually. Get Metcash. Okay. So I have, you know, my final question before we finish this off. What has motivated you and kept you inspired all these years to do this work that you do? I think it's because um, when when I was growing up, I, I didn't have a father. So everything was actually um, because of the government. And I realized that the government could help me because of the taxpayers. You know, people who actually um, contribute to tax. And they are the ones that, that sent me to school, that gave me an education. So this is one way that I do that. So I may not be the richest person out there, but I could give my time. So what I would like to see is more women have the opportunity and more girls, you know, pursuing a technical career or any kind of career that, that brings value to society. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Aiza, for your time. So we had such a brilliant time with you today. Thank you again. And for everyone, we will share these links as well when we put up the podcast. So thank you for your time. Take care, Aiza. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening in. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, leave a comment, and share with your friends. Be sure to tune in to the next episode and to find out how to be part of Societal Shapers, head to www.plcadilla.com and check out our coaching programs. Catch you soon!